Greetings. My name is Michael Cullen. I am a senior associate consultant and assistant professor of medicine and cardiovascular diseases at Mayo Clinic. Today, we are going to be discussing TEE guided cardioversion after cardiac surgery. I have no financial disclosures to report. The learning objectives for this presentation are to, first of all, be able to review indications for transesophageal echocardiography prior to cardioversion in patients after cardiac surgery. Secondly, to identify risk factors for left atrial appendage thrombus after cardiac surgery. And finally, to recognize the implications of surgical left atrial appendage intervention on the need for TEE prior to cardioversion after cardiac surgery. Much of what we know about TEE-guided cardioversion comes from the ACUTE study, which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2001. The ACUTE study enrolled patients with atrial fibrillation of at least two days who were scheduled for a cardioversion. The ACUTE study randomized these patients to the conventional strategy where they received three weeks of anticoagulation, were cardioverted, and then received an additional four weeks of anticoagulation versus a TEE-guided strategy where they were acutely anticoagulated with heparin or warfarin, were cardioverted if they did not have thrombus on their TEE, and were then anticoagulated for another four weeks. And the acute study found no difference in embolic events between the two arms, no difference in cardiac death, and more bleeding in the conventional arm due to the greater exposure to systemic anticoagulation. Cardioversion success rates were also higher in the TEE-guided arm, and patients in the TEE-guided arm had a shorter time to cardioversion. And so the algorithm from the ACUTE study has really dictated clinical practice regarding the use of TEE to guide cardioversion since. However, some questions remain. In particular, what about patients with atrial fibrillation or other atrial arrhythmias after cardiac surgery? Is that a special population that we should be treating any differently, especially given the frequency with which atrial fibrillation occurs after cardiac surgery? Secondly, what if patients just had an intraoperative TEE? Many of our patients undergoing cardiac surgery now have a TEE in the operating room. If they need to come for a cardioversion in the immediate postoperative period, do they need another TEE before their cardioversion? And so to answer these questions, we looked at patients coming to our cardioversion unit within 30 days of cardiac surgery if that cardiac surgery included an intraoperative TEE. We excluded two patients due to thrombus on their intraoperative TEE. We excluded 359 patients who did not have a TEE with their cardioversion. We excluded 93 patients undergoing surgical left atrial appendage intervention. And we excluded one patient with a prior percutaneous left atrial appendage closure. That left us with 362 patients undergoing a TEE-guided cardioversion within 30 days of cardiac surgery, as long as that cardiac surgery included an intraoperative TEE and the intraoperative TEE did not show any evidence of intracardiac thrombus. So who were these patients? What were their characteristics? We found that 71% were male and that the mean age was 71 years. You can see their clinical characteristics in this table. It's very typical of a cardiac surgical population. You can see that hypertension was present in 60%, coronary disease was present in 48%, previous atrial arrhythmias were present in 40%, clinical heart failure, either systolic or diastolic, was present in 27%, and 19% had systolic dysfunction with an ejection fraction less than 50%. The median time from the operation to the cardioversion was six days. So when these patients came for their pre-cardioversion TEE, how often did we find thrombus? We found new left atrial or left atrial appendage thrombus in 13 of the 362 patients for an event rate of 4%. The median time to thrombus development was seven days after the operation. What were risk factors for this development of new thrombus? The strongest risk factor in our study was a clinical history of heart failure. 
7% of the patients with a clinical history of heart failure developed thrombus versus only 2% without thrombus for an odds ratio of 3.3. Patients with an ejection fraction of less than 50% before their operation were also more likely to develop thrombus, with 9% of those patients developing thrombus versus 2% with an ejection fraction greater than 50% for an odds ratio of 3.8. We did not find that any other variables were significant, so things like age, gender, coronary disease, history of atrial arrhythmias, prior stroke, or duration of atrial arrhythmias did, were not significantly associated with thrombus development. So this is an example of the type of patient that we would have been included in our study. This is a 69-year-old female undergoing a pericardectomy. Here you can see her pre-bypass TEE and who post-bypass interoperative TE. And in both situations, the left atrial appendage does not demonstrate any evidence of thrombus. However, when she came for her pre-cardioversion TEE six days later, you can see new thrombus in the left atrial appendage. So in this situation, the cardioversion was canceled. So how did our patients do after their operation? We looked at 30-day postoperative outcomes that included stroke, TIA, and death. And you can see that event rates are very low across the board, including very low event rates, only one case of stroke and one case of death in patients who had thrombus. Ultimately, when we looked at our composite outcome of stroke, TIA, or death, we did not find any association between new thrombus and our 30-day uh, outcome. Granted, the event rates were low. However, based on this data, we can conclude that patients with atrial arrhythmias after cardiac surgery require a careful evaluation with a TEE prior to cardioversion, especially in the setting of heart failure or a low ejection fraction, even if they just had a TEE in the operating room that did not show any evidence of thrombus. Now, you'll notice that in this analysis, we excluded 93 patients with a surgical left atrial appendage intervention. What do we know about surgical left atrial appendage interventions? The guidelines the valvular heart disease guidelines recognize that ligation or amputation of the left atrial appendage is commonly performed in patients with atrial fibrillation with the aim of reducing the risk of thromboembolic events, although no randomized controlled trials have demonstrated a beneficial impact. We also know that surgical intervention on the left atrial appendage is frequently incomplete. Some studies have shown that over a third of patients undergoing surgical left atrial appendage intervention will have evidence of left atrial appendage patency when they have surveillance TEEs. But specifically, what about patients coming for a TEE-guided cardioversion shortly after surgical left atrial appendage intervention? Specifically, how often in the setting of cardioversion in the early postoperative period do we find that the left atrial appendage is patent? And secondly, how often do we find new thrombus, either in the left atrium or left atrial appendage, that might influence whether or not the patient could undergo their cardioversion? So to answer these questions, we performed an analysis in our 93 patients who we initially excluded for their surgical left atrial appendage intervention. And what were the characteristics of these 93 patients? 66% were male. The mean age was 68 years. Their clinical characteristics were generally similar to the patients that did not undergo a surgical left atrial appendage intervention that we discussed earlier, with the predominant exception of the fact that atrial arrhythmias before the operation were much more common in those undergoing surgical left atrial appendage intervention. 70% in this group versus only about 40% in the previous group, which makes sense. If the patient has a history of atrial fibrillation, the surgeon is more likely to intervene on the left atrial appendage when they're in the operating room. So when these patients came for their intraoperative TEE, how often did we find both left atrial appendage patency and thrombus? we found the left atrial appendage to be patent in 34 of our 93 patients for a patency rate of 
New thrombus was present in 26 of the 93 patients for a 28% thrombus rate. When we look closely at these 26 patients with thrombus, we found that 16 of the cases of thrombus, so uh, almost two-thirds, occurred in patients with a patent left atrial appendage. Put another way, 16 of the 34 patients with a patent left atrial appendage developed thrombus. That was 47%. And a patent left atrial appendage was actually the strongest risk factor for development of new thrombus. We found that 27% of the thrombus cases occurred in patients with a successfully closed, non-patent left atrial appendage. And three cases of thrombus, so 12%, actually occurred in the left atrium. When we consider these cases of left atrial thrombus and thrombus in patent left atrial appendages together, we find that 19 of our 93 patients, so 20% total, had what we called systemically accessible thrombus. In other words, thrombus that was potentially accessible to the systemic circulation would the patient have been cardioverted, or even if they were not cardioverted. This is an example of a patient that we just discussed. So this is a patient with a partially but incompletely ligated left atrial appendage. You can see evidence of color flow on the Doppler images between the left atrial appendage and the left atrium here. And you can see thrombus in the left atrial appendage. So this is an example of what we consider to be systemically accessible thrombus that occurred in 20% of our 93 patients. And in this situation, the cardioversion was canceled. So what can we conclude from this data? We can conclude, as other studies have shown, that surgical left atrial appendage intervention is frequently incomplete and that patients referred for cardioversion after surgical left atrial appendage intervention require careful evaluation with TEE for both thrombus and left atrial appendage patency, even if they just had a TEE in the operating room that did not show any evidence of left atrial appendage thrombus. And so what are the take-home points from the, these analyses that I have presented? So first of all, patients with risk factors for left atrial appendage thrombus or left atrial appendage patency should undergo a TEE prior to cardioversion in the early period after cardiac surgery, even if they just had a TEE in the operating room. Secondly, heart failure, whether it's a clinical history of heart failure or a low ejection fraction, is a risk factor for new left atrial appendage thrombus after cardiac surgery. And surgical left atrial appendage intervention is frequently incomplete and does not obviate the need for a TEE prior to cardioversion in the early post-surgical period. Thank you for your attention and have a good day.